Well, hello and welcome to this week's Bible lesson. Uh, let's start with a prayer. Father, we're grateful and we're thankful for your word and for our opportunity to study. And we pray that what we might find today in your scripture is, is important to us as we try to be more like Jesus. Forgive us when we fail you. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Well, hello again. Welcome. Uh, we are going to be picking up in the the tenth chapter of Second Corinthians as we kind of make our way through the, the Corinthian, the Second Corinthian letter here. <clears throat> Just by way of catching up, the first seven chapters of the of the the, the, the book of of, uh, of Second Corinthians were pretty much dedicated by and large, uh, toward the Apostle Paul expressing his appreciation for the repentance that the, that the Corinthian brethren had, had made, by, most of them, uh, as a result of his first letter. Uh, so we get to chapter 7, and then 8 and 9 are Paul giving, boy, I tell you, the de facto uh, standard on giving in the New Testament. Uh, there's just really nothing... Nothing more inclusive in the entire New Testament that, that gives us some insight about our attitude, about the purpose, how much, etc. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a great study uh, that we've just finished up with chapters 8 and 9. He kind of shifts gears again in chapter 10. And it's, it's when he wrote the first Corinthian letters to correct the problems that were going on in Corinth at that time. And, and there was just this laundry list of problems that they had. The vast majority of the church, it would appear, repented and 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 stopped doing those sinful things. Uh, however, there were a certain group uh, that have kind of been designated by most of the the theologians and the commentators as, as false teachers. And I think when we get to chapter ten, he he's going to begin to take a focus on that group. Uh, and goodness, he's going to call them. He's never going to go come out and, and, and point names. He's never going to come out and, and, and identify them as that. But what is inferred is just so clear uh, when, he, when he talks about such a person and they say and some of those and some. Uh, just, just so many references to a group that is clearly still in a sinful state. Uh, and it's it's something that Paul does pretty frequently. Uh, he's he's a little bit he's a little bit sarcastic, you might say, with them. He's he's a, he's a little bit uh, pointed with them as as he could always be. Uh, but that's kind of the idea of of the tenth chapter specifically, as as we're going to work through it. And it's of all the chapters, I think. It's not the only one, but it's it's one of the most direct and pointed uh, that we find in the Second Corinthian letter. Unlike the First Corinthian letter, which was just full of that, that from kind of start to finish. So, let's pick up in Second uh, Corinthians chapter ten, verse one. Now, and and so just just from just the way he starts that, you can kind of see we're beginning a new thought here. Now, I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, I think in, in, in our vernacular, he, he's saying it as softly as he can uh, to, to kind of start this off uh, and in a manner that would, that would befit a Christian. Uh, now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. Now, keep in mind, this is almost like an introduction to a new thought, or it is an introduction to a new thought. But in some aspects, he's he's using. Boy, I, I'm just always hesitant to use the word sarcastic, but he's using a uh, something that that the false teachers are making a claim about him. So, if you go down to verse ten of this same chapter, listen to what this is. This is Second Corinthians chapter ten, verse ten. For they say, now that would be the false teachers. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive. And his speech contemptible. So they're taking very much shots at him and basically saying when he's in front of you, he's very meek and mild, but when he writes these letters, he's very pointed and, and direct. And and Paul is kind of using that as it is in his introduction, uh, somewhat sarcastically, I think. Uh, but then again, he's also going to say, Yeah, there's some truth to that. When when I'm in front of you, I don't want to be confrontational and I don't want to to not show love. But when things have gotten so bad that I have to write you a letter to correct something, 
I'm not going to I'm not going to just mess around with this thing. I'm going to go I'm going to go directly at the problem. And I, I so a little bit of a little bit of both in his introduction there. I who am meek when face to face with you but bold towards you when absent. Again, you you can kind of you can kind of taste a little bit of, of both things. I ask you that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence of which I propose to be courageous against some. Now that's that's the first reference that we have against kind of the the outside group that has not yet repented, uh, has, who has not yet come to repentance. Uh, and he, he refers to them, I guess you would say this was the group of false teachers uh, against some. And, and clearly from that indication there, it's plural. But I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold. I don't need to be as direct and as forceful with you when I'm in your presence. With the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. So what would be inferred from that is some in this group of false teachers are claiming that Paul is is sinful in some way or he's walking according to the flesh. Now that's a that's a phrase that Paul has used much in his uh, in his teachings to indicate someone who is who is kind of the opposite of of of, of, of having the attributes of Christ, fleshly attributes, things that are, are carnal of nature, sinful, as we would say. He continues then on in verse in verse three. It's kind of the same this idea. For though we walk in the flesh, I mean I think he's saying for though we, we are still physically alive, we are still physically in this in this shell, this body, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We, what we are, what we are going to confront and defend ourselves with is is not is not going to be personal, and it's not going to be it's not going to be kind of we're not going to we're not going to take undertones or, or try to undercut in a, in a personal manner. We're going to keep this thing godly, Christ-like. Uh, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according. To the flesh, you see what he's saying. He's he's just says we're not going to get down. We're not going to get down on their level. We're going to keep this thing as 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 pure as we possibly can. But it's going to have to be said that there is some there is some things that they're doing that are inappropriate. Uh, Paul continues on in verse three. I'm sorry, verse four. For the weapons are of our warfare. Now again, the warfare that he's talking against against evil, against false teaching. And the weapons that he's that he's talking about are not again things that are carnal of nature. He's not he's not going to go in there and say and say things that that kind of that kind of would be getting down on the level where they are. He's going to keep it above board, very very humble and very kind as as he possibly can. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. But divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Now, to me, that that's Paul saying, I'm going to use the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which I possess, to defend myself in a godly manner, in a Christ-like manner. I'm not going to get down on their level and and do it with insults and and those kinds of approaches. Uh, kind of setting the stage of how Paul is going to going to address these people. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, the destruction of evil, the destruction of false teaching, the destruction of anything that is against the, the precepts which Christ has, has given us. Verse 5, he kind of goes back to talking about them. Listen to what he says. We are destroying, and, and listen to this, speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. So anything that is tangent or opposite of what God has given us through His teachings, whether that be through Jesus, whether that be through the writings in the New Testament, anything that is that, that we have access to, yeah, listen to that again. We, we are destroying that. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. Anything that is that is against the Father, whether it's again the teachings or the writings, we are trying to destroy those kinds of things. And we are taking every thought captive. I like the way he puts that. That's something that I think we can do where we we all sin. We all have thoughts and we all have actions that we do that we regret. They're, they're sinful and they're, they're, they're things that are against how we are trying to, to mature as Christians. 
but we try to control those. When, when, we, when we do do those things, we, we have a desire to change and to repent and to, to improve, to become more like Jesus. We are taking every, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I mean, that's, that is, again, that's the essence of Christian maturity, to, to take who we were and to become who we will be, and that is like Christ. I mean, it's a lifelong endeavor, and we'll never perfect it, but we will always strive to, to do better, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience. And, and I mean, that's, that, is, that is Paul saying we are able to correct the, the things that are, are being done incorrectly. Whenever your obedience is complete, that they are... They are now back into a state where they are with God again. Remember in the first Corinthian letters, there were many of them doing things of the sinful nature that was causing them to potentially be lost. They have now corrected that, and now Paul is trying to continue to correct with these false teachers. We are ready to punish all disobedience. Verse 7, you are looking at things as they are outwardly. So he's, he's basically saying, you are seeing this happen. You, you, are, you, are, you are witnesses to this. You are... You are saying, you are looking at things as they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ, so also are we. These men were saying, we are, we are of Jesus, but they're trying to, to make Paul look bad. Paul is saying, no, that's not the case. That's not the case at all. If they are trying to be like Jesus, then they are like us. Because we are actually emulating the Christ. Excuse me, just one moment. A little lighting issue. For if you're looking at things as they are, if anyone is confident, and, and that would be that would be someone who is who is striving to be like Christ, if anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ so are we also. If you are trying to emulate Christ, then you are being like Paul. I mean, you are, you are trying to be on a path that takes you toward eventually, throughout your life, becoming like Jesus. Uh, so it continues on in verse 8. For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, and the authority that Paul is going to get, he's going to clarify this. Some, some translate, translations have this, these next few uh, words in parentheses kind of to, to accentuate them and put emphasis on them. For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, and then he's going to talk about that, which, is, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you. I mean, that, the authority that Paul has is given through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, extraordinary, which he was given by the Lord. And Paul is saying that is not for the purpose of destroying you. That is not for the purpose of breaking you down. That is for the purpose of building you up and bringing you to salvation. For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be put to shame. Paul is, he, they are effectively trying to, to checkmate evil. I mean, they are trying to, to do everything they can to remove this evil from their presence. That's, that's the idea that I think he's trying to give there in this particular sentence where, where he says, <clears throat> I will not be put to shame. Four, I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. Now, keep in mind what they're saying, and, and he's going to talk about this in the next verse. They're saying, oh, he sends these horrible letters when he's away, but when he's there in presence, he, he does. he's not courageous, he's, he's, he's timid. Paul doesn't want to, to run anyone away from Christianity with his letters. What he's trying to do is send information to them so they can understand the error of their ways and make corrections. Come to repentance. That's the, that's the idea. So listen to what he says again. For I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. And then it goes into verse 10, and we've already talked about this a little bit, but this is, this is the claim that these false teachers are making. For they say, I mean, that's, again, we've, we've had them referred to in several different ways. For they say, and again, plural, uh, the idea that there was more than one uh, in the group. For they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. I think they're saying Paul is, is cowardly and subservient. Uh, 
and that, that's, not, that's not the apostle at all. Uh, think about all the examples that we have of him having courage to, to address people with, within and without uh, of, of the church, uh, even up to as, as much as having to confront the, the, the clearly the most well-known Christian of the time, Peter. Uh, Paul had the courage to, 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 to go face to face with him when Peter was wrong and correct him. This is, this is clearly not a, a, a representation of the Paul when that for his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. And then Paul said, he says that and he says, now think about this. So listen to what he says here in verse 11. Let such a person, now that's again a different way of referring to this false teachers. Uh, they say uh, against some, such a person, different ways, same one referring to the same group. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word and letters when absent, such persons we are also indeed when present. Paul is, is, is kind of rebutting that claim that he was, he's harsh with a letter and meek with a, with a person-to-person visit, with calm dignity of what, he's, of, of what he's trying to say. Basically, he's saying, I want you to consider this. So, let such a person consider this, that we are, by wor- we are in word by letters when absent. Such persons we are also indeed when present. Paul saying, I'm the same when I'm there. I'm the same when I'm writing you a letter. Both times I am doing whatever I need to keep you in the, in the, the, pro, the proper and the, the good relationship with the Father. I mean, that's, that's, that's Paul's whole goal here, is to keep people from, from drifting away from the faith. And, and that's what he's saying. I'm, I'm the same wherever I'm at. If I'm writing a letter or if I'm there. Then he continues on, verse 12. For we, and I want to talk about we. He's referring, he used that word an awful lot. When Paul is, is writing this kind of this rebuttal to these people, the we that he's talking about is a multitude of individuals. It's, it's the people who were along with him on, on the when when he when he brought the gospel uh, to to Corinth back in Acts chapter eighteen. It would be it would be Paul. It would be Luke. It would be it would be Titus. Uh, different individuals sending this letter will be Titus and Luke and an unnamed brother that we talked about back in chapter 8. That's All of these individuals that, that are, are engaged in these missionary efforts are the we that he's talking about. For we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those, again, referring back to the false teachers, who compare themselves to those who compare themselves, but when they compare themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not they are without understanding. Here's, here's what he's saying in that verse. It's kind of hard to understand because Paul is saying these false teachers are putting themselves up as the as a standard, putting themselves up as a measuring stick of which other people should try to attain. Paul says that's not that, that's not appropriate at all for them to use themselves in, in their in their in their fallacy. And he says they are without understanding when they are using themselves as the standard by which others should measure themselves. Paul's saying that's not proper. He continues on. But we will not boast in verse 13, but we will not boast beyond our measure, but within the measure of the spear which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you. I think Paul is saying that. Here are these people that are only in Corinth and they are trying to tell these Christians, you need to act like us. You need to do what we, what we tell you and not what Paul tells you. When they're only in Corinth and Paul is saying, look, I have this spear that's much, much larger. And, and listen to the important part about that. For we are not, verse 14, for we are not overextending ourselves as if we did not reach you. I mean, we were the ones who brought you the gospel. As, were, as we were the first to come, back in, uh, back in Acts chapter 18, even as far as you in the gospel of Christ. I mean, that is, that is such an important piece for us to appreciate. Let's go back up to 13 as, as we're kind of trying to understand this, this, this still that Paul is talking about where he's taking the church to all, he's taking the gospel to all of the, of the different uh, areas uh, where, where Gentiles exist. But within the measure of the spear... 
verse 13, were God apportioned to us. I mean, God is the one that sent them. I mean, that's, that's such an important differentiation between him and the and the the false teachers they are just taking it upon themselves to lift themselves up to standards paul is saying hey god is the one that sent me uh, it's not me coming to you it's god sending me to you that that's the idea that i think we're trying to get here which god apportioned to you as a measure to reach even as far as you to reach into you. God directed them to go into Corinth. For we are not overextending ourselves as if we did not reach, as we did not reach you. For we were the first to come, even as far as you, again, God sent us in the gospel of Christ. I mean, we were, we were bringing the message directly from the Father of the gospel of, of the Savior. Uh, again, the argument being Paul trying to differentiate himself and make these Christians appreciate the fact I am not holding myself up. I am holding Jesus up. These false teachers are holding themselves up as a standard, and it's just not appropriate. Verse 15, not boasting beyond our measure, that is, in other men's labor. So, again, a little bit of sarcastic where, where these false teachers are kind of trying to do stuff where Paul has already planted a church and started a church and, and converted Christians, not boasting beyond our measure. That is, in other men's labors, like they are trying to take advantage of Paul's work. But with the hope that as your faith grows, we will be within our sphere enlarged even more by you. So Paul is saying, from the simple fact that I brought the gospel to you under the direction of God, converted you from that the gospel will grow even further as a result of, the, of, the, of those efforts to to others the gospel will propagate itself uh, is the way that I look at that not boasting beyond our measure that is in other men's labors but with the hope that as your faith grows as you become more uh, mature in your faith you will teach others and this is the way it says we will be within our sphere enlarged even more by you, I mean that's that's what Paul is trying to talk, to, trying to get across to these Christians that he brought the gospel to them at the direction of the Father. Continue to teach them, continue to stay engaged with them, and as they mature, the 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 church will grow even more because of their faith. Uh, really, really a beautiful teaching. So continues on to verse sixteen. So as to preach the gospel even to the regions beyond you. I mean, that is, that is Paul with an expectation that is, as the church grows, they will go out even farther. Even to preach the gospel, even to the regions beyond you, and not to boast in what has been accomplished in the sphere of another. Again, don't be like the false teachers. Do as, as we have been an example, being directed directly by the Father to come to Corinth. Uh, so as to preach the gospel even to the regions beyond you and not to boast in what has been accomplished in the sphere of another. They are trying to take advantage of Paul's efforts in Corinth to when he started the church. And then I love the way it is in verse 17. He's done this oh, multiple times in, in the Second Corinthian letter especially where he will take an Old Testament an Old Testament passage and bring it in and incorporate it into his writings and make it applicable to to what he's talking about here so essentially uh, writing scripture with scripture uh, is what is what i would think in verse 17 but and then this is again an old testament passage he who boasts is to boast in the lord what we do as christians and what paul did as a missionary and what paul did as a as a forerunner of the gospel or a forerunner to bring the the, uh, the gospel to corinth it was never about Paul. It was always about Jesus and becoming more like Jesus and, and bringing His gospel where these, where these false teachers are trying to make it about them. They're trying to say, look at us. Look at, look at how we do things. And if you go back to the First Corinthian letters, you, you see multiple times where they are doing, doing things such as eating meat sacrificed to idols in the temple. Uh, it was sinful and, and inappropriate. But they were, they were holding this up as to, to other Christians as, well, we do this. Look how strong we are. You need to emulate us. And Paul is saying, no, that's not the case. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And that's, 
that to me is the essence of, of, what, of what this entire chapter is, is about. False teachers trying to, to take advantage of Paul's work and bring attention to themselves rather than bringing attention to Jesus and making, making our goal as Christians to be more like Him. Uh, we, we never want to set anyone else up, up, up on a standard with Him. Jesus is the standard, the only standard, the only measuring stick for how we operate and how we act as Christians. Uh, but he who boasts is to boast in the Lord. And then he finishes off in verse 18, kind of again, kind of referring back to those false teachers. For it is not he who commends himself, he who commends himself, talking about a false teacher, for it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. In the end, we will stand in front of our God. We, we will never stand in front of a single man. What men say about themselves and what men say about me is irrelevant. What Jesus and God commend me for and my actions and my maturity with all of us, that is what is important. And, and, when, and when Paul says, for it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. I mean, that's, that is the essence of, of what is important in our lives. I don't do things to impress others. I do things to impress my Father. I do things to please Him. I do things to, to bring glory to, to God, to bring glory to Christ. That's, that's why we do what we do as Christians. And these false teachers were doing it for the wrong reasoning. And, and Paul is, again, in this entire chapter of chapter 10, really trying to, to encourage the, the majority to not listen to these few, the minority, uh, and to remain faithful. Uh, so it's a very powerful chapter. It's kind of hard to kind of hard to work through uh, some of the times, uh, understanding who he's talking about, understanding how he's making references. But again, uh, I think you, I think you've, you've heard what the essence is. Uh, make your life about Jesus, no one else. Uh, let's close with prayer. Thank you, our God, for this wonderful teaching. Anything that we get from the Gospels and the, the various epistles from Paul and different letters that we are, we are blessed with from the New Testament help us to be more like Jesus. And this one, especially this particular chapter, has a good number of things that we can apply to our lives and, and try to emulate to be more like our Savior. May we never be so arrogant as we try to place ourselves as a standard, place ourselves as an, as a, as an example above Jesus that that is clearly taught against here in this chapter. Forgive us and love us always, we ask. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.